this is more informed than a simple Google search. You're gonna find a whole bunch of stuff that's, in my mind, easy solution. If there was easy fix to treat your gallbladder or gallstones without surgery, then my clinic would not be full of people who are symptomatic from gallbladder problems. Hi, my name is Dr. Rich Hilsden, and you're watching my channel, Knife Skills. Today, I wanna to talk to you about artificial intelligence and healthcare. I was on Twitter recently and I came across this thread, which says, I mean this sincerely when I say chat GPT might be the most incredible tech to emerge in the last decade. Here's how I got it to create a weight loss plan complete with a calorie targets, meals and a grocery list and a workout plan. And he goes on and sort of explains this. Elon Musk says chat GPT is scary good. We're not far from dangerously strong AI. This response says, I agree on being close to dangerously strong AI in the sense that AI poses example, huge cybersecurity risk. And I think we could all get to real AGI in the next decade. So we have to take it extremely seriously. And it says here things like chat GBT is an AI that has mastered a unique hill human skill. It knows the shape of a good answer, but not often the details. We're now learning that even technical people are happy with an answer that looks right instead of is right. So interesting. This Paul Graham person says the striking thing about chat GPT, it's not just the number of the people who are blown away by it, but who they are. These are not people who get excited about the new shiny thing. Clearly something big is happening. So when I see these tweets, I thought, you know what, maybe we should go ahead and explore chat GPT from a healthcare perspective as a surgeon. I'm not sure if you remember IBM Watson, but IBM Watson was a computer that use natural language and deep learning to essentially beat the best Jeopardy players. And they really believe that this would have strong value in healthcare. And of course, uh, that's been something that they promoted and advertised. And they eventually sold the health version of the Watson technology to a company called uh, Merative. And I thought it'd be good to just explore their website uh, really quickly and see some of the things that they uh, suggested were of, of value. So they have a little promotional video here. What does it take to see beyond a single moment of care? It takes seeing an individual as more than simply a patient in a care center, a member of a health plan, a recipient of social services, or a participant in a clinical trial. It takes seeing each person's past, understanding their present, and anticipating their future. That's why at Meritive, so it's we're taking important to care about people, uh, look at their past, human understand their present, and anticipate the future. Okay, I get it. So that's Meritive's promotional video. A couple things to take from that. First of all, you know, end-to-end -end decision making, access to data, helping governments, all these things sound great. But I'm always skeptical when I'm looking at any promotional thing that doesn't talk about specifics. What exactly is the advantage of their AI technology? What is that doing to help the individual provider? Apparently it's gonna reduce costs or there's some claim that's nebulous here, but what specifically is doing it? Is it helping speed the process of diagnosis? Is it helping the doctors choose among a wide variety of treatments? What is the exact role of AI? We do use computer-aided decision-making in surgery. There are databases that we can access and we can punch in patient information. The computer can give us a sense as to the outcomes that that patient might get. But in reality, the bedside test, what we say, the gestalt, that feeling you have when you're examining a patient, looking at them directly, that is so much more powerful than what any of these computer tools have been able to generate. But I am interested in seeing where technology has come. Now with things like OpenAI and ChatGPT, we can actually try and play around with these AI tools that are accessible to people like us. And as you can see on Twitter, there's so many people who are super interested about what ChatGPT might offer. And so I thought, let's take a look at it from a surgeon's perspective. So I'll pull up ChatGPT on my page here. And we'll go for, through a few things. First of all, it talks about examples, explain quantum computing in simple terms, 
got any creative ideas for a 10 year old's birthday party? What are its capabilities? It can remember what we said in the conversation. It allows users to follow up and make corrections and it's going to decline uh, inappropriate requests. And it'll be interesting to see how it handles healthcare situations. There's a few limitations. They say is it may be occasionally generate incorrect information and I wouldn't expect anything else. I mean, if you're artificially simulating intelligence, there's going to be some error by definition. I think that's one of the beauties of being part of life. Part of being an intelligent being, so to speak, is the possibility of error. And of course, we can't expect that uh, something that's going to simulate uh, intelligence in some way would be free uh, from error. And there's some limited knowledge of more recent events. From a medical perspective, things change slowly in healthcare. So I'm not expecting that there be any issues. For me, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what's some of the most common things that happen in my clinic. So I'm going to stick with hernias because hernias are super common. Patients come to see me all the time and it'd be interesting to see what Jab chat GPT offers for advice if someone has a hernia. So I think what we'll do, I can imagine a patient uh, would say something like I have a lump in my groin. Could this be a hernia? It's possible that the lump in your groin could be a hernia. Hernias can occur when there's a weakness or tear in the abdominal wall, which allows parts of the intestine or other abdominal contents to protrude through the opening. This can cause a lump or bulge to the affected area. It's important to have any lumps checked out by your doctor. How about this? I think I have a hernia. Should I get surgery? important to see a doctor. I think it's good that the computer is recognizing that healthcare providers have a role and they can only determine whether hernia is necessary or not. In some cases, hernias can be treated without surgery, but in other cases, surgery may be the best option. If your doctor recommends surgery, it's important to weigh the potential and risks and benefits. Well, since it's talking about risks and benefits, uh, what are the risks and benefits to hernia surgery? The potential risks and benefits of hernia surgery would depend on the specific type of surgery you're having and the individual situation. In general, some of the potential risks include infection, reaction to anesthesia, damage to surrounding organs. This is almost word for word what I say to patients, actually. I say infection, bleeding, damage to surrounding tissue. These are, uh, you know, a common spiel, which in my mind makes me think that this open AI technology is clearly almost parroting what uh, doctors have said, maybe even things that I've said in my YouTube videos where I talk about risks of surgery, I'll throw out these things. So open eye, if it's scouring the internet for doctors who've talked about these things, I, I got I almost get a sense that it's parroting it back to me, which is uh, interesting. These complications are rare and most people don't experience it. So some of the benefits of hernia surgery include relief of pain, improved ability to perform physical activities, reduced risk of complications such as strangulation. Overall, the potential benefits are heard you heard your surgery usually outweigh the risks and, and that's my perspective as, as well. So sometimes though, the question would be then what kind of uh, surgery should it have? So I, I know as an educated person in medicine that there's open and laparoscopic approaches. So I'm actually interested to see what chat GPT uh, says about it. What are the differences between open hernia repair and laparoscopic. Open hernia repair and laparoscopic hernia repair are two surgical techniques that are used to treat hernias. The main difference between the two techniques is the way in which the surgeon accesses the hernia. In open hernia repair, the surgeon makes a single large incision to the effective area to access the hernia. This allows the surgeon to directly visualize the hernia and repair it. Open hernia repair is more traditional technique uh, and has been used for many years. This is, this is uh, totally true. In laparoscopic hernia repair, the surgeon makes several small incisions. Both open hernia repair and laparoscopic hernia repair can be effective in treating hernias. The choice of technique will depend on the type of hernia. So let's see if there's a difference. Is there a difference in outcomes between open hernia repair and laparoscopic? 
There's some evidence to suggest that laparoscopic hernia repair may have slightly better outcomes than open hernia repair. For example, laparoscopic hernia repair may result in less pain and faster recovery for some patients. However, the evidence is not consistent and the choice of surgical technique will depend on the specific type of hernia. Ultimately, both open hernia repair and laparoscopic hernia repair can be effective in treating hernias. The best approach will depend on specific circumstances. So that's very true. Um, I will say it's, it's a relatively vague answer. Like how much better are the outcomes? That being said, I agree with their comment here that the evidence is actually not uh, that consistent. What are the non-surgical options? In some cases, hernias can be treated without surgery. Non-surgical options for hernia include wearing a truss or a belt. They can provide support and help reduce the bulge. Dietary changes, reducing constipation, avoiding abdominal strain. That's good advice as well. Avoiding activities that increase abdominal pressure, heavy uh, lifting and straining. They don't really mention that much here about weight loss and some other lifestyle things, which I think would be really important. If you are struggling with your weight and you have a hernia, that would be one of the first steps I would suggest that you take to actually reduce the risk of a hernia occurring. But overall, I'm, I'm fairly uh, Im impressed by uh, this uh, as well. I will say none of this information is more than what's capable beyond a Google search. There is an element of curation here that suggests that um, this is more informed than a simple Google search. Oftentimes when we have a Google search, and especially if you're even on YouTube, if you're searching hernias, you're gonna find a whole bunch of stuff that's, in my mind, easy solutions. I see that all over YouTube, like so many just easy fixes. And the reality is that if there was an easy fix to treat your gallbladder or gallstones without surgery, then my clinic would not be full of people who are symptomatic from gallbladder problems, right? They would be making the dietary changes. They would find their herbal supplement or whatever it would take to solve their problem. They just simply wouldn't be in my office, but they come to my office because they've tried those things. They've tried all this advice and they failed and they're still having problems and looking for a definitive solution. And my office is certainly not full of people who have had gallbladder surgery and wish they didn't. Those people who have those operations usually come back and are very grateful and thankful that they're able to live their normal life. If you've got a painful, uncomfortable groin bulge and it's bothering you, same thing. You may try a truss or some other things, but oftentimes people find themselves in a doctor's office, in my clinic, getting the definitive treatment, the true surgical treatment. And so one thing I will say about ChatGPT is that it's actually acting in a much more informed way than a typical Google search on uh, the computer. And it's good to see that. It's also, I would say, aware of its own lack of knowledge. It keeps saying, look, this decision to have surgical care is complicated. You should talk to your doctor about it. You should work together with your doctor to find the appropriate treatment plan for you. And so when I look at that, I actually see this as a useful tool. Is it powerful? Is it, is it, is it world changing? I would say what special about it is its ability to naturally interpret our language. The answers that are coming back are very logical for the questions that I'm asking, even if it's not providing what I would consider uh, exciting insights They're very general insights, just like the one comment on the Twitter feed that I was looking at was that they are essentially claiming that chat GBT has done a great job of sort of both providing kind of fluffy answers for questions that might be very specific. So, you know, you know, what is the rate of strangulation with a hernia, right? It's not telling me that rate It's saying that's a possible, um, complication. When it, I asked about the complications of hernia repair, again, gave general information, but maybe not specific numbers. It'd be hard for someone to really truly be informed with that kind of general uh, discussion. That being said though, when I look at this, I do kind of hear doctors talking. I hear that, that tone uh, and there is a bit of ambiguity because each individual's risk is different. If you have a smoking history, a, an issue with your weight, maybe chronic alcohol use, a sedentary lifestyle, those types of things will all weigh in on your ability to recover and have a good outcome regardless of what surgery you're performing. And so it is difficult to pinpoint with you a specific risk.
Uh, and so doctors will talk in kind of generalities and the informed consent process will oftentimes have generalities. And I see some of that coming out here in chat GBT. That being said, it's a super interesting tool. It's gotten really popular on Twitter. And so I thought I would give a, a little bit of a perspective from my point of view as a doctor working with this open AI technology. If there's anything you want me to react to, review, or take a look at, please leave a comment down in the section below. I would really appreciate it. Thank you again for sticking around to the end of this video. My name is Dr. Hillsden, and you've been watching Knife Skills.